It's my great pleasure to welcome to the podium this morning as our keynote speaker, Professor Hugh Watkins. Professor Watkins, like those four other guys, is famous on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean, having done a lot of his seminal work in Harvard University. And if you look back at some of the incredible papers that came out in the early 1990s describing the genetic underpinnings of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you'll see his name there. And more recently, um, he's the chair of a British Heart Foundation Center of Excellence at the John Radcliffe Center in Oxford, where he has really pushed back the, the, the knowledge or pushed forward the knowledge boundaries in our understanding of what genomics can contribute to the diagnosis, the understanding of cardiomyopathy, and more recently, the understanding of a number of cardiac risk factors for heart failure and ischemic heart disease later on in life. Uh, in his spare time, he also finds time to be the head of the Department of Medicine, which I think probably takes up a couple of hours a day. Um, and it's going to be a wonderful session here with, uh, with our first keynote speaker, Professor Watkins. I'd like to remind you all, please, to take your cell phone and switch it to silent so we don't have too many disturbances. And Professor Watkins will be taking questions afterwards, so I'll ask him to remain at the podium. Professor Hugh Watkins. Great. Well, thank you very much, Paul, for the introduction. Um, it's very exciting to be here. You've got a fantastic um, program to tackle heart failure. It's not easy, but I think you've got a lot of momentum, which is, is great to see. I, I'm glad also that we're, we're starting with genetics. I am I'm biased, but I believe you should always start with genetics. <laughs> so um, Mansour set the scene by saying what I wanted to start with, and that is that a theme throughout your meeting will be that heart failure is extremely heterogeneous. And we know the model of treating everybody the same doesn't work. So there's a big drive to say, can we become more sophisticated? Can we come up with a more precise diagnosis? Can we at least stratify patients? I'm guarded about personalizing. You'll, you'll see that. But can we at least stratify them in an informative way? Can we come up with better markers? And can we do something about what's basically in heart failure, not a successful drug model. We hope that stratification will help, but I'm going to argue also that I think that the, the causality you get with genetics might help us validate targets. So can we do these things? Everybody wants to do them. The, the, the topic of my talk is to look particularly at whether genetics and genomics can do them. I'm really glad there's a talk later on saying, you know, what's beyond the genome, because the genome does not solve by any means all of our problems. But it's a good place to start, and there are great expectations, I think largely because the technology has moved amazingly fast, and we can do things at genome level that we couldn't do before. But you'll see that I'm rather cautious, actually. I think there are some unrealistic expectations. I'm a little bit guarded about these predictive categories outside of certain circumstances. I'm pretty bullish about validating targets, but it takes time. So I thought what I would do is set out my stall at the beginning and then try and persuade you why I have the viewpoint that I, that I have. And there are two messages here. And one is, if you're thinking about these diagnostic categories, the prediction in an individual, and you want to do it with DNA, that will only work where your gene has a large biological effect. And that is not always the case. And outside of that context, I think we've got a bit of wishful thinking going on. In contrast, if you want to use the causality that you get with mapping a gene that causes a change at protein level and causes a phenotype, if you want to understand biology or show causality of a risk factor, that genetic effect will work whether you've got a gene with a large effect or a small effect. That always works. So that's why I'm more confident about the utility of this approach in all settings, this one just in some settings. So to illustrate what I mean for those of you that don't think about genetics, about large effects and small effects, let me illustrate the two extremes of the spectrum. So the large effect end is inherited disease. So this is a disease where having one mutation is enough to switch you from a normal population to a disease phenotype. It's a binary switch. It's dichotomous. If you've got that variant, its odds ratio will be very large. And by and large, these are mutations that change the, the structure and function of a protein. They're in the coding sequence. At the other end, we have the um, now much more understood common variants with small effects. These are not sufficient to make someone have a disease. 
but accumulation of a number of variants might shift you from normal to, let's say, diabetes or hypertension. So this is a threshold thing. You have to have a whole bunch of them to cross the threshold. It's quantitative. And by and large, these are non-coding variants that you get outside of the coding bit of the genes. And we pick these up not in families, but by doing case control studies. So these are opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, I think we all now understand, and probably have always understood, that it is a spectrum. It's a continuum. And you will sometimes see um, this sort of schematic, which illustrates how we think about genetic effects. So at one end, we have the Mendelian monogenic mutations that run in families. They're pretty rare. This is an old slide, and I put one in a 1,000. Got that wrong. I'll show you later why. Um, I put high penetrance, but I put no numbers here. Come back to that. At this end, we have the common variants. Here they are. You might have a variant affecting more than a tenth of all the alleles in the population. They have a low effect size. And you'll see that I haven't tried to fill in the spectrum. Many people do in many reviews, and they're rather optimistic. They put it as a straight line. But if you talk to someone who works on, let's say, plant genetics, they've been doing this for a long time, they say, no, it won't be a straight line. It's going to be an exponential curve. I've lost my mouse like this. And I'll come back to that, because that turns out that really matters. We've got fantastic new tools in genomics and genetics that many of you will know about, and you will have heard about even if you don't work in the area. The rare disease end, we've been able to do from the 1990s, exactly as, as Paul introduced. We were able to map genes in families causing inherited cardiomyopathies a long time ago. For about the last 10 or more, 15 perhaps years, 10 years, I guess, we've had genome-wide association studies, fantastically powerful using DNA arrays to find these common variants. And then relatively more recently, we've had the capacity to do lots of large-scale whole genome or whole exome sequencing, and the hope has been to find variants with intermediate effect size somewhere in between the two. But you'll see that this slide was done putting this in the optimistic position in the straight line, i.e. relatively large effect sizes. Turns out that isn't usually the case. So um, if I start at the simple first question on my list, can you use DNA for diagnosis? This is where I will put most of my time in the talk. Um, because this is the bit which is real and now where we've got the most data. So can you look at DNA to determine whether a condition is present or not? This is obviously, I would argue, only going to work where the DNA gives you a dichotomous result. You find the variant, yes, you've got a diagnosis. And that's Mendelian disease, almost by definition. So if you've got a patient with heart failure, here's a, an MR scan you'll all be familiar with, it will matter whether that person has unexplained dilated cardiomyopathy or, let's say, a specific variety, like the lamin AC mutation cardiomyopathy that has a very high risk of sudden death. That will matter to the patient because if it's lamin AC, you probably put an implantable defibrillator in. Equally, in a family where you've got a disease and you want to know, do the immediate relatives have it or not, that's dichotomous. Mendelian genetics works very well here. So in the setting of Mendelian monogenic disease, this really works, and it can be, and it actually is transformational of care. But I put in a couple of caveats here, confirmed genes and confirmed cases or families, and I, I will show you why. So if we're talking heart failure and we're talking Mendelian, we're obviously talking about inherited cardiomyopathies. It's a fairly complex area, classically classified by the, the morphology of the heart. You'll all be familiar with this. For heart failure, by and large, the big one is dilated cardiomyopathy. If you look at a fairly young population, like a transplant population, about half of your cases will be labeled dilated cardiomyopathy. We would think about half of those would have a Mendelian or strongly inherited disease. Um, we know that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy turns up in heart failure series. Also, burnt-out HCM look, looks like heart failure. These conditions are Mendelian, I mean, excuse me, are allelic in that they, 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 they share certain disease genes here, but different mutations, I should be specific, some mutations in sarcoma genes cause DCM, different ones cause HCM, no one causes both. ARVC is genetically different. Clinically, it's different. If you find a patient with heart failure and your genetics in the end tells you it's ARVC, again, you expect a much higher arrhythmic burden. 
And then there are a couple of entities I won't talk about much, but left ventricular non-compaction, relatively recently recognized with better imaging, not always a discrete condition. We see it with both DCM and HCM. So if this is the Mendelian end, this is your starting point if we're talking about genetic testing and heart failure, but I think it is specifically in individuals in whom you can make one of these diagnoses or someone who's got a family history. And I'll show you reasons why, if you just take all comers of heart failure and test with these genes, you'd like it to work, but by and large it doesn't work. So this is the familial end where you've got someone with a family history. And then I added to myself, because it's really important for this audience and this talk, there are particular circumstances about cardiomyopathy in young children that favor genetic disease. Genetic disease is a bigger proportion of the whole in kids. And I think the kids are much more tractable than the adults. And that would include de novo onset of severe mutations. There are some recessive disorders. This is predominantly an adult resume. So I must remember to always come back to kids because I think you've got some real opportunities here. So genetic testing works, and, and the main reason it works is that clinical diagnoses of these entities is not as easy as you would like it to be. And if you're handling a family, it's a problem for you. So if I think of a typical family, most of these disorders are autosomal dominant. A bit different in kids, but in adults, almost always autosomal dominant. If I find somebody here who's got a DCM or an HCM, I might well find a couple of other relatives who've got the same disorder. But there's a whole bunch of other people who now are at one in two or one in four or one in eight risk, really big risks. And their evaluation can be hard. The disease can be subtle. We see a lot of non-penitence. There might be confounding factors. It might look like DCM, but they've been drinking too much alcohol. It might look like HCM, but they're hypertensive. Um, we know that we can't really work out what's going on in the teenagers. So if you use clinical tools to try to cascade through a family, it doesn't work very well, and you don't get as far through the family as you would like. And DNA can cut right through that and actually do so in a very cost-effective way. And ironically, in HCM, which is the best advanced, it was our health economics analysis that got this into guidelines. So if you're in Europe, and you're talking about HCM, this is now a class one indication. So our standard advice is if you see an individual with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and you've got family members you want to evaluate, you should go for DNA testing, not for clinical tools. It's not yet as widely adopted as it should be, and I don't think it is over here, and we'll, we'll come back to that. This doesn't hold um, yet in, in the US, and I don't imagine it does over here, but the data are pretty strong. And the cost-effective data in our health system will be similar to yours. It's actually cheaper. Some of the scans we do and some of the follow-ups are really expensive. So this is pretty simple, and I think most of you should be familiar with it. If you've got a patient who's got, in this case, HCM, could have been DCM, but it works more easily in HCM, and I'll show you that, we do genetic testing, and if we find a definite mutation, we use that to determine who's at risk. And we then, by and large, use clinical tools to decide how we're going to deal with them. But if you find a relative who does not have the mutation, then you are negative. You are able to discharge them. They don't need annual follow-up. They don't need echoes every few years. They don't need CMRs every few years. And this is where the, the cost savings come in. If you don't find a mutation, you're stuck with clinical tools. But in HCM, we actually know that this is a, a different disease, a different natural history, milder disease, and less chance of recurrence in the family. And then the wrinkle is the variant you can't interpret. And this slide's only a year or two old, but we've come to realize this is a much bigger wrinkle than we thought. And I want to spend a bit of time talking about this, because this is the reason why population testing, or even testing an average heart failure, doesn't really work very well. So we had warning signs of this, but actually it was one of these unknown unknowns that's crept up on us a bit. Warning signs come from data like this. This is the data from genetic testing in dilated cardiomyopathy from the Harvard Partners Lab. And it shows that they've added genes to their panel that have been solidly implicated in DCM over the years. And in red is your yield. And it's gone up a bit, but not very much. And in dilated cardiomyopathy, it's still a bit disappointing, around 20%. But what's really gone up is the proportion of patients to have a variant that you just can't interpret. And this is now a real problem because almost everybody's got one or other of these, and it can't be that they've all got genetic disease. So these are the people who've got nothing at all. So most of these will be false positives, and they're really hard to evaluate. 
So as you widen the number of genes, you get some increased yield, but you get a really nasty loss of signal to noise. So why is this happening? The answer is very simple. Now that we've sequenced thousands of genomes, we know that these individually very rare or indeed private mutations that you've only ever seen once are together extremely common. I think about 10 times more common than I thought they were five years ago. And that's a problem because it means that the tests that we've used when we were claiming genes or claiming variants in the literature over the years were not robust enough. And so the literature turns out not to be reliable. There are, without doubt, lots of overcall variants, and I will show you now actually overcall genes. And this is sobering, and it's a problem. It's been made worse by one particular facet, and that is when you're finding a DNA variant, you have to decide, is it a polymorphism, or is it rare enough to be causing your disease? And we used to just think, you know, anything less than 1% was, was, was a polymorphism. Very wrong. Current papers typically look for an allele frequency less than half a percent. And anything rarer than that, they think, is in frame as causing disease. That doesn't make any sense in a disease that affects one person in 500 and is caused by thousands of variants. It's, it's just wrong. So we now know pretty much what the answers are. So we've got very large numbers now. So I've looked in the Oxford data, which is probably the biggest series in the world. I've looked at the partners' data and said, what's the commonest clearly convincing cardiomorphically causing variant in any disease. And it turns out to be this missense mutation here that's the commonest cause of HCM in European and, and US North American populations. We've looked at it in 3,500 cases. We've got a very clear handle on how often we see it, 1.5% of our cases. If we look at our best population reference. This is the Exome Exam Aggregation Consortium. We only see three instances of this variant in 60,000 people. So that's way, way, way rarer than 0.1%. It's actually way rarer than 0.0%. So we would argue that we've got about a tenfold error in the threshold that everybody is using. And we should be looking for variants in cardiomyopathy and other Mendelian disease that are rarer than 1 in 10,000 or 0.01%. And if you do that, you get rather different data. So I'm going to show you um, analysis of data that's combined the Oxford lab and the partners lab for cardiomyopathy testing. And these are really hefty numbers. So we've been um, panel gene sequencing almost 8,000 cases. And I'm comparing with 60,000 population reference samples. These are all the genes that we're testing. And in color is our yield of variance in our cases. These are unrelated cases. And in gray is our yield in the population of rare variants, rare enough that we would look at them and go, well, they're in frame for causing disease. So there is a good signal to noise here, but it's not necessarily quite as good as you would like. But most of the genes that we discovered through linkage in the 90s are absolutely fine. But there are a couple of dodgy apples um, I've got here alpha actinin. We're finding more variants in our controls than in our cases. That's true also down here. So not all are performing in the way that you'd expect. And if you look at that in terms of odds ratios, um, plotted here are odds ratios for missense mutations. Where truncations cause disease, you get much better separation because they're rare in the normal population. But most of these genes are dominant negatives. They're not null alleles. But for most of them, we have decent odds ratios but there are one or two that clearly aren't performing well. So there are genes out there that are being tested in diagnostic labs that should not be being tested in HCM because they're either not causing disease or at least they can't be interpreted. But that's the good news story because when I turn to DCM, which is the condition most relevant to heart failure, it's much less pretty. So here are DCM genes. It's very heterogeneous. Many, many genes are implicated. I'm going to talk a little bit about Titan. Titan has a really good signal to noise, but low penetrance. I'll come back to that. And you get Titan mutations in a good 15% of patients with unexplained heart failure DCM. Some of the other genes behave well. I mentioned Lamin earlier. Lamin's here also performs well. But a whole bunch of others, you find there are really no more variants in cases than controls. That's a horrible result. It either means the genes are wrongly implicated or variants that cause disease are just a very small minority of the variants that are rare enough to cause disease. You can't interpret them. 
So if I plot this as odds ratios, again, the genes with null alleles being pathogenic perform well. Some of the genes, and they were all found by linkage analysis in families, stand up, but actually the majority of them don't. And these, again, are all being tested, and they're all being included in research studies and diagnostic labs. And I think it's leading to some quite erroneous conclusions. So we, to make the point in the paper that we've just submitted, we analyze other people's data. It's a horrible thing to do. I'm going to have to mind my back when I go out into the world. Um, this is a, a series of dilated cardiomyopathy patients published from the US. I've kind of anonymized a group because it's less emotive. Um, three papers published in decent journals looking at genetic testing in 300 patients, families, probands of dilated cardiomyopathy. And plotted here on the y-axis is the number of variants thought to be pathogenic. So, for example, got 14 here and MIBPC3. Plotted here is the number that we actually believe are pathogenic, having filtered out the ones that are just way too common. So if you're doing well, you're on this line. And the genes on this line are the genes that we know about, lamin, the sarcomere genes that were found through linkage. If you're on this line, we think everything is a false positive. So these papers propose that myosin binding protein C is the second commonest cause of familial DCM. They found 14 variants, but that's the exact same number you would get in controls. So I suspect it's just a, a wrong result. So genetic testing needs to be in genes that's validated. And all that's out there is not validated. And the move to have bigger and bigger panels and say, send your sample to my lab, we test more genes, doesn't turn out to be a good thing to do. A slightly side issue that I wanted to think about, because I see the world differently from my US colleagues, and I'd love to know where Canadian physicians sit, is how big an odds ratio has to be before you look after your patient differently. And I've got three examples here. So I talked about this particular mutation in HCM. Because we've got big numbers, we know it's odds ratio with reliability, and it's whopping. And this turns out to be a mild HCM mutation. The reason it's common is it's a founder. It's out there for generations because it doesn't tend to kill you. But it's still a huge odds ratio. So if I see a patient who's got this variant, I do know that they're at risk of HCM. I will follow them up for, for, for throughout their life, even if they look normal. That's, I think, easy. I think we'd all do that. A trickier one is we know the South Asian population has a very common founder variant in the same gene that causes a soft splicing defect. 4% of South Asians have this defect. It gives you an odds ratio for cardiomyopathy of about 5, 6, or 7. Very good data. We know that that's reliable. Now, cardiomyopathy is a rare disease. If you start out at 1 in 500 chance, and you've got an odds ratio of 6 or 7, you're still very unlikely to get it. So I don't follow up these people. I don't cascade it through families. I don't know what to do with it, even though it's quite a big effect size. My American colleagues, when I say that at meetings, look shocked and are shocked, and they say they would follow them up. But I point out that 4% of the South Asian population is a very, very large number. Um, and largely, they're not being followed up at the moment. So I would say that's not actionable in a rare disease. And then in the middle are titan truncation variants. And this is an important thing to think about if you're interested in genetics and heart failure, because these are common. There's a very strong signal to noise, but they have low penetrance. So the odds ratio here is 20. So again, if dilated cardiomyopathy is quite a rare disease, and you have an odds ratio of 20, you still probably will not get dilated cardiomyopathy. I think 90% of people with these truncations will not get dilated cardiomyopathy. So do you follow everybody up for the 10% that might in 10 or 20 years get disease? I don't know. That's a, that's a healthcare provision question. I think what you're seeing with titan truncations is that they make you vulnerable to other episodes that cause disease. And there's a nice paper in the New England Journal that you may have seen from James Ware showing that they are present at the same frequency in peripartum cardiomyopathy, including in mums who recover, as in familial dilated cardiomyopathy. So I think what they're saying is that they give you a genetic susceptibility and some other hit will take you into disease, but you can recover. So these are somewhere in my spectrum. They're not monogenic, they're not common common, but they're in between. I put in one slide about whole genome sequencing. I think it's going to come up later. Um, the point I want to make is if you're working in kids, 
you're in a much better place than if you're working in adult disease. So we've done 500 whole genomes for medical diagnostic sequencing in Oxford, a lot of collaborators. This was a paper published earlier this year. And what we learned is that if you've got um, a de novo mutation, so you've got an infant who's got terrible cardiomyopathy with normal parents, or you've got recessive disease, particularly if not in consanguineous, if you've got compound heterozygosity, then going straight to a genome will often take you straight to a diagnostic result, fantastically powerful. But in adult dominant disease, it's quite tricky. And if you've got four or five affected members, you end up with a list of about 10 possible disease-causing variants that are not really easy to nail down. But if you're doing pediatric cardiology, genome sequencing um, can, work, can work really well. So just to wrap up sort of the genetic diagnostic side of it, I think the, the message here is that even though the DNA can measure with precision, its interpretation is probabilistic, just like every other test any physician ever orders. And for it to be giving you a clear answer, you need either a high prior likelihood of disease, or you need a really large odds ratio, so your posterior odds are big. And this has some important implications. We should be testing the right genes, not all genes. Big gene panels are probably a bad thing to do at the moment. You need sophisticated knowledge of what types of mutations and which domains cause disease. That means it needs an expert lab. Computer algorithms don't do this well. Non-expert labs don't do it well. And if you throw the whole thing wide open and test all the genes, either very big panels or exomes or genomes, again, your odds go down, your noise gets much, much worse. If I sequence all the genes ever implicated in cardiomyopathy in all the people in this room, and I accept any variant that's rare enough to cause disease, 60% of you have got one. It's not helpful. And therefore, you also need high prior likelihood in the patient. And this is the reason why we're currently testing people who've got disease. So if you've got a cardiomyopathy and you want to know which one, it works. If you've got a cardiomyopathy and you want to know who's got it in the family, it works. But if you took all come a heart failure, you just get terrible noise over signal. And then the last cautionary note here is it has been recommended that if you found a cardiomyopathy mutation when you were doing whole genome sequencing for something else, let's say eye disease, possibly you should report that back to the family because it's actionable and you might save lives and relatives. But here, your prior likelihood of being pathogenic is much lower. And I think we're probably not able to reliably do that at the moment, even though it is recommended. That's diagnosis, that's most of what I want to talk about. I've got rather less to say about prediction of outcome or treatment response. Partly is because it doesn't work so well, and partly is there's not much here that's new. Broadly, my, my summary is that this works somewhat, where you've got very large Mendelian effects or somatic effects in cancer. It can work a bit, and we may hear about that in the meeting, where you've got moderately large effects. Adverse drug reactions sometimes influenced by a small number of genes. Defects can be pretty big. Um, very extremes of a simple trait, likewise, are sort of getting towards an endelian. But none of this does it work as well as you would like. And I'll illustrate that with cardiomyopathies and sort of a, an overview slide of what genotype phenotype correlation has done for us. Less than we wanted. I kicked this off. I was the first person to, to show genotype phenotype correlations in a cardiomyopathy with HCM back in 1993, but it doesn't work all that well. There are some gene-specific predictive clues that are important, certain specific diagnoses. So lamin cardiomyopathy is different. If you think someone's got sarcomeric HCM, but it turns out they've got Fabry or LAMP2 mutations, that's different, different inheritance patterns, enzyme replacement treatment. But for most of them, you do get gene-specific effects this gene may have a worse prognosis than this one, but there's really big overlap, and so much overlap that he doesn't really individualize your care of your patient. And then when you come down to the individual alleles, this is the real problem. We didn't know this. The allele probably counts about as much as the gene that it's in, and there are thousands of them. So we don't have really big data. We don't have 500 people with this mutation so that we know how it behaves. So this holds us back. It means it may work one day, but at the moment, it doesn't work very well. By and large, we use clinical tools. We cascade with DNA, these clinical tools. I don't think this should surprise us, because if you think about it, the journey from your mutation in your gene all the way to your phenotype is a very long one. We know it will be influenced by a million modified genes in a lot of different pathways, a lot of environmental and epigenetic effects, a lot of stochastic effects. 
And it doesn't really surprise me that knowing this does not really very well predict that. And that's at the rare disease end, which is as good as it's going to get. It's going to get much harder in complex trait. So my sort of strap line for people who work in the clinical world is I still think we counsel the genotype. We use the genotype to work out what the recurrence risk is in families, in kids. But I still treat the phenotype. You know, if, if someone's got a, a rather worrying mutation, but their heart's not worrying, I don't reach for an ICD. I don't believe that you should. And just to sort of drum this home, I'm going to show you the, the most shocking example that really brought me up fast, though it was actually quite a long time ago. When I was first working in this field, there used to be two classic cardiomyopathy rodent models. This was before we all had transgenic mice. And I, there were two Syrian hamster lines bred out of research groups in Japan that you would look at with a wild type control. There's a nice HCM model, looks great HCM, a nice DCM model, great DCM. Well, when we started genome sequencing, it turns out that the HCM and DCM model have the exact same mutation. They both have a loss of function allele in delta sarcoglycan, and they've been bred onto different backgrounds to give these completely opposite phenotypes. So that tells you knowing that it's delta sarcoglycan did not help you at all because it's a very long journey. So I'm a bit guarded about prediction. Well, what about mutation-specific treatment? That clearly could change all of this. And I want to touch very briefly on trying to do something at the DNA level to target the mutation and the notion that actually you might come up with a, a treatment that is specific to the actual effect on the protein or a class of mutations. And these are new, but they're very exciting, and I'm not sure I know where they're going to go. Targeting the mutation at the DNA level um, has always been, recently been technically possible through knock down RNAi. Most of these are dominant negatives. You've got to knock them down quite a long way. But genome editing might really bring this into frame. I'm not sure it's going to start with heart disease. I think the heart is hard compared to, let's say, fixing a, a bone marrow defect with an inherited arrhythmia. But some of you may have seen um, in Duchenne's, uh, not a million miles away from heart, Eric Olson's got really impressive data with AAV delivery of a CRISPR-Cas9 system to do exon skipping in, in, in dystrophin. Um, works fantastically in the mouse. And he's very gung-ho about doing that in, let's say, hand muscles, um, which could transform the, the life of a kid with, with, with Duchenne's. So this may, this may come. Let's think also about the idea that if you know the precise mutation effect at the protein level, can you target that? And I think other speakers may come to that. There are beginnings of some quite encouraging signs. I think the best one in the heart failure field um, comes from Myocardia. That's a company related to cytokinetics that you'll know about, um, built up by Jim Spudich, who can do small molecule screening for molecules that interfere with actomyosin in a way that will ameliorate what the mutation does, in this case, in HCM. So most HCM mutations increase ATPase and contractility. That's something I've shown in, in, in my lab. Um, so he's screened for a small molecule that does the opposite of that. If you give too much, it just stops the muscle contracting, so that's not good. But if you get the dose right, it has a very impressive effect in a mouse model. So this may become possible. But Jim will know that only a certain group of mutations in certain proteins would respond to this particular molecule. You need another one for other groups of proteins. And then you get into a problem of just how small the strata can be for a treatment to be viable. And I guess the best data of this come from the cystic fibrosis Vertex story that most of you will be familiar with. So Vertex have this extraordinary drug which can open CF channels in patients who carry this particular missense mutation, usually in combination with the common um, Delta 508. And it's an awesome agent. So this is a single patient in Oxford who's running along with quite poor um, FEV1, gets Ivacaftor, and has a transformation in his well-being. But the catch is there's only about 300 patients with this mutation in the UK. Treatment costs 200,000 UK pounds a year. It's just about affordable because there only are 300 of them. The moment you had one of these agents, everybody with cystic fibrosis, there's no way a nationalized health service or probably any health service could afford it. So if you really individualize, you have that problem. So I'm more interested in using our, whoa, I didn't mean to do that. That's not a pretty sign. Hold on. Let's see if I can rescue this. It may rescue itself. I wonder what I touched. 
It's looking fine. You can, I'm confident. Brilliant. Okay, back on. I'm more interested in trying to use the causality you get from DNA to find final common pathways. I'm not going to talk about my mechanistic work in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy today. It doesn't fit. But suffice it to say that we think that the very multiple diverse mutations that increase ATP consumption do the same thing as mutations in AMPK that stop you measuring ATP amounts do the same thing as mutations in your mitochondria that stop you making ATP, and they all cause hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So I'm more confident that if we can target the overall energetic compromise in this condition, we've got a treatment that works for everybody, rather than targeting this particular mutation or this particular one. And actually, this is going quite well. Um, we've got orphan drug status for, for hexaline. Um, it's a phase three trial, some of you may know, going on in, in the US. I won't talk about it now, but it comes back to why I'm excited about doing genetics for discovering mechanisms, not for predicting for individuals. But let me switch now to the complex trait situation, because I want to spend the, the last little time thinking about how much can we extrapolate this to garden variety heart failure. And I think you'll guess what I'm going to say, that actually in common disease, genetic effects are small, and numerous, and they're not good for prediction, they are good for biology. And we know this for good mathematical reasons. We know the heritability of a lot of the components that drive the different forms of heart failure. I know the total genetic signal for risk of MI, um, diabetes, hypertension, cardiac hypertrophy. What we now know and didn't know before is we also know the number of genes involved, turns out to be many, and the size of genetic effect turns out to be small. And the moment you know that, you know mathematically they're not very good for prediction. And I'm going to try and illustrate that. Again, my caveats are they're not, given, not good for a specific disease for most people. And I'll come back to these. First of all, number of genes. There is not a gene for heart failure or a gene for heart disease. I made the mistake of trying to explain this to a tabloid. I'm sure you have newspapers here that are as bad as our Daily Mail. So I explained to this woman that there were actually dozens of genes for risk of coronary heart disease. And the headline came out, there are 18 genes and they've all been discovered today, which was embarrassing. And I spent a long time trying to apologize to my colleagues. What I was pointing out was there are hundreds and we found 18, which is rather a small proportion of the total. So we now know through genome-wide association study, if you look at almost any of the factors that drive heart failure, you find tens or hundreds of genes contributing. So that's a number, and we can put that number um, in the calculations. We now also know effect size. So you remember this slide I showed earlier where I didn't have any numbers on my y-axis, and I wasn't sure the shape of the curve here. Are we going to see big effect sizes, or are we going to see a straight line? So we now know that data, and I will illustrate data for, not that one, for coronary artery disease. That's why I've done most of the work. So here we have a summation of what's known from genome-wide association studies from a truly prodigious number of cases and controls. I'll come back to heart failure. No one's done it for heart failure yet, and partly because you can't find 100,000 people with heart failure very quickly or very easily. So if you do genome-wide association study and look for variance in effect sizes, you do get the exponential curve that I spoke of. So the shape of the curve is as I thought. So these are common variants becoming low frequency, becoming rare. You only get a lift up in effect size at the very rare variance. And the lift up is not very much. Look at the odds ratios. The biggest we get is about 1.4. So earlier I was talking about an odds ratio of 6, odds ratio of 20, 200, 600. These are odds ratios of 1.4. They're tiny. So the moment you know that there are hundreds of genes of tiny effect, you need to be very cautious about the idea that you can genotype a patient and say, ooh, you're at risk of heart failure or heart disease. And that's been known from simple mathematical models for a long time. Uh, this is the data that I think first said it very clearly comes from Rotterdam. It's modeling data. It's studying a disease that affects 10% of the population. It's pretty good for heart failure, pretty good for diabetes. It's studying a, a disease where they've got 40 contributing variants. That's optimistic. It's normally more. They have, um, they're going from uncommon to common, 
and the authors set up a now optimistic effect size, starting at 1.05, which is actually about realistic, going up to 2. So this is an optimistic scenario. And on the x-axis here are the number of risk genotypes in a model population. You could actually, of course, have 40 of them, but nobody does because they're, they're not all common. But let's take here like 17. If you've got 17 risk genotypes, your risk of disease is pretty big. This is median risk here. A few are below, most of them are at risk. So there's a very big spread, but if you were someone with 17 variants, yeah, you're at pretty high risk of diabetes. But below the black one in the pale histogram, I hope it shows, is the number of people that have each gene score. So if I take my example of 17 risk alleles, hardly anybody has 17 risk alleles. And hardly anybody has so few that they're clearly predicted. Everybody in the population sits in the middle and has a pretty much average risk. So it's not a good predictive tool. If I typed all of you for the SNPs like this to say, what was your risk of, let's say, heart failure, almost everyone in the room would say, oh, it's average. There would be two or three who would say are protected. There would be two or three who would say are high risk. So it's not a good test for saying, is Mrs. Smith at risk of heart failure? If we had genome sequence on everybody, it's a bit more useful because then there are lots of diseases you're interested in and maybe some of us are at one or other extreme for more. So you might one day get to a stage where if this is in your medical records, a few of us would say, yeah, you're at risk of prostate cancer, you need screening. But most people, by definition, are average because of the mathematics of it. So not as predictive as we would have liked. And I think the same goes for your likelihood of responding to a treatment. So you keep reading about drugs that are being marketed in common disease for people who have this SNP or that SNP. I don't think any are convincing. Some of them I won't go into now have been shockingly wrong. I've had letters from lawyers for showing data showing that they're shockingly wrong, and then later the FDA closes down the, the test and the prescription. There's a lot of wishful thinking. It would be lovely if common DNA variants said, oh, you need an ACE inhibitor, you need a beta blocker. But they don't, and I don't think they will. Now, if you're sitting there thinking, God, this guy doesn't believe in stratified medicine, you've got me wrong, and to make that clear, I fundamentally do. I just think it's naive to think that DNA is going to do it for the reason that I've shown you. It's a long journey from DNA to your phenotype. So I think stratification will work, but we need to be much, much closer to the disease phenotype. And most of you probably intuitively know this. If you've got... Uh, an endophenotype, an intermediate phenotype. It will integrate all that DNA variation, lots of it. It will integrate all your epigenetic modifications and your environmental triggers, and you will be much closer to disease. You'll have bigger strata. It's much more likely to work. So I love stratified medicine. I'm just getting nervous that DNA, now we know the numbers, ain't going to deliver it for you. What DNA will deliver you is some new markers. So even in coronary disease, we find genetic association that implicates novel cytokines that no one previously thought were causing coronary disease. We now know they're causal. We know they're quite good biomarkers. So it can do that for you, but it's not the DNA itself. So again, I, I picked just a nice example to show. It comes again from a spiritual medicine. It's not usually my, my topic, but from colleagues, again, in Oxford. So if you work in the spiritual world, you'll know that about 10 years ago, GSK made a humanized monoclonal to damp down IL-5, which is the cytokine that um, causes um, mast cells and, and eosinophils to become activated. And they tested it against FEV1, and it didn't work, and they shelved it and, and, and canned the program. So Ian Pavord, who works in Oxford, has done a lot of work on this, and he shows that if you use an intermediate phenotype, which is the presence or absence of eosinophilia. He did it originally in sputum, but you can do it in blood. It splits the population pretty much into one-third and two-thirds. In those who've got the eosinophilia, drug works beautifully well. So this is now a salvage drug. It's back on the market. It's going to be used. Here's a clinical endpoint study. Um, this drug works. It only works, though, in people who've got COPD, and eosinophilia, and not COPD without eosinophilia. So this is the kind of stratification we should be doing, not what particular genotype these people have. So if I'm cool on DNA for prediction, I'm bullish on DNA for biology and targets. And the reason for that 
is I think we've got quite good data that you're not hamstrung by this problem of effect size. And that allows you to work in rare disease, experiments of nature, get fantastic insights, but also to work in common disease through things like genome-wide association study. Um, and some of the examples that come from this come from the, the experiment we do is saying, okay, if we look at our GWAS hits, do they identify known drug targets? There aren't yet new drugs coming through GWAS. There's some are, are, are pretty close. So if I look at coronary disease, this works really well. So if I look at our, our catalog of genome-wide association implicated genes, we find this list of genes here that are targets of current or emerging, indeed genetically driven, novel targets. These are drugs that work really well, and it doesn't matter that the genetic effect size is small. So you can find a genetic um, effect that tells you that tiny genetic variations, up or down regulating HMG-CoA reductase, increased risk of coronary disease, come along with stat and give them a big hit, get a big effect. It doesn't just work in the patients of that variant, it works across the population. So genome-wide association studies would have identified these, and I'm sure they will identify new targets, and it will be very powerful. Has it happened so far for heart failure? No. Rather resounding, no. Um, and I've got just two slides on that that I will finish up with. This comes from a review from Jake Lucis and colleagues. And on the first bit of the table are currently implicated genome-wide significant loci for heart failure, one. Um, for diabetes, it's over 100. Coronary disease, about 60. Um, most diseases are working. Why is heart failure not working? Part of it is no one's yet done really big studies. It's much easier to find 50,000 or 100,000 people with myocardial infarction than it is with heart failure. They don't survive very long. We don't have all the, the registry data. You're, you're working on that. Um, but the other problem is heart failure is just rather problematically heterogeneous. And we probably need to break it down into intermediate phenotypes to get genetic power. So from um, Jake's review, he's arguing that if you do a simple study, heart failure, yes, no, because of this complex etiology and because of environmental variation, you don't get signal to noise. And this is the current study. People have tried this. It hasn't worked very well. But if you are breaking it down into components of heart function that you believe contribute to heart failure, they are much, much more tractable. If you look at specific homogeneous entities, they are much, much more tractable. Um, and if you clean up the environmental background, you do it in animal models, or you stringently select your patients, you get more power. So if we ask about GWAS studies in this type of entity, the situation is better, but still not as good as you would want. So these are components that in this review were considered intermediate phenotypes, components of heart failure that are gene and Y significant. LV internal dimension, for example, is good. I'm not sure I put aortic root size here. Um, wall thickness is good. It's just beginning to come along. If you limit your genetic search space, you get more power, but there are, there are problematic reasons with that. Uh, that's here. If you look at founder populations, you get more power. It's just beginning to happen. I think what will change it will be registries, and you're good on that, and precision measuring your phenotype in a quantitative way. And because I know what's going on in the UK, not what's going on in, in Toronto and Canada, um, I will just illustrate very briefly where we are with UK Biobank. This could work really well. It's a huge study, um, half a million subjects. I'm proudly one of them. So whenever Rory Collins is saying he's looking forward to lots of events, I, I wince. And, but it's still a powerful study. We are going to have imaging, including CMR, on 100,000. We already have a fantastic um, genotyping array that I helped contribute to um, from Oxford. We've already got the DNA data. We don't have blood counts back, but we've got the DNA data on 150,000. We'll have the half million by the end of the year. We won't have these clinical data for a couple of years. So you've got time to get in there and, and get some results out. But if you combine this sort of phenotyping with this sort of genetic data, you will get results. And I believe they will be mechanistically informative and they may really help us with new targets. So to try and wrap up, um, I'm going to go back to my two extremes, although they're on a, on a spectrum. In inherited familial disease, um, the variants have large effects. They are really useful for working out who's at risk or not. And sometimes they predict risk. 
whole genome sequencing can work, and it works well in infants with severe disease, and it's all powerful for biology. It doesn't matter if the disease is very rare. There are drugs coming to market that were discovered in nine patients, for example. But in common garden variety heart failure, these are small effects and numerous. They're not good for prediction. Um, they aren't very good for stratified medicine. But there will be novel loci, even in heart failure, and they will be good for new biology. And even if the effect sizes are small, doesn't mean they're not tractable. So I hope I've left time for questions. That was my intent. I hope I've not been too gloomy. Some people think this is gloomy. Um, but I think we need to guard against over-expectations. Thank you for your attention. I'd like to thank Professor Watkins for an incredible overview talk, which gave us the entire spectrum of the range of questions that need to be asked. Um, I'm hoping that there are some floor microphones available. Yeah, I see a couple there. Are there questions from the audience? Let's, uh, let's ask Professor Watkins. And if you have a question, please raise your hand. A microphone will come to you. While we're waiting for that, it seems, Professor Watkins, you've made a pretty good argument that we actually know enough about the genome uh, sequence and coding aberrations that cause this disease, but not quite enough about the phenotype. Would that be accurate? Yeah, I think it is. Um, it, it's, a, it's much, DNA is just easier. You know, now that we've got the technology, you know, um, each individual DNA base is, is digital. So ironically, it's now easier to get precision and certainty at the DNA level than it is at the RNA, protein, phenotype, downstream biology level. And there's a bit of a, a, a catch up. I think that's, I think that's very accurate. Mm -hmm. And it's partly led to this over-enthusiasm, over over-optimism that once you know the DNA, you can sort it all. A question here at the front. Thank you, Dr. Watkins. That was a very interesting lecture. Uh, my question was about the burden we put on genetic test. We expect a genetic test, a genetic result to answer yeah. completely. And yet we have many diagnostic tests and modalities that all they're doing is, again, making a prediction of a certain amount of risk. So I think, as you pointed out, it's probably a combination of the genetics with the other factors. And, and maybe the expectation is unreal, but, but, but can be slowly chip away by putting all of this rather than saying that the gene, gene alone is going to be the answer. And so the focus may have to be a little different. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I mean, there are, at the best end of the spectrum, the effect size of the gene is so big that it trumps everything else and you're fine. So there are variants in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that, have, that are completely absent in the 60,000 normals. And everybody who gets them gets disease. Same for DCM. If you find one of those, you've got the whole answer. But more typically, you haven't. If you're starting in someone who you think's got cardiomyopathy, it will probably work. But if you're starting in someone who may or may not have, it probably won't. So I think the setting we use DNA testing drives how well it will work. But you've always got to be mindful of that clinical phenotype, both for interpreting the DNA, but more specifically for planning what you're going to do with your patient. And I get very nervous when people come to my clinic and they've got an ICD in because they've got the same DNA variant as the one their sister had and she died suddenly. I just don't think it's that predictive. And I think we've, we've slightly overstretched what, what we can do. So it's just part of the picture um, and you need to be very careful who you test and, and what genes you test. Question from Dr. Stevenson. Dr. Watkins, this is just a marvelous talk. I'm so excited to see something that someone who actually teaches us both the potential and the limitations, which um, Thank you. Um, I think one of the most interesting things that, that you mentioned is if you take someone with some other cause, peripartum cardiomyopathy, and link it to a gene, to what extent has this been done with other causes? For instance, tachycardia cardiomyopathy, um, alcohol cardiomyopathy, adriamycin cardiomyopathy, mm. um, to go back and see what the ratio is of the abnormal gene in that population. Yeah, you know, it's really untested at the moment. And it would be surprising to me if there were not results to be found there. And actually, I think it will happen quite quickly. There's a, a good place to test maybe the, the Titan variants for the reason that they're quite common in DCM. So 15% of your DCM population will have them. 
as far as we can tell, all titan truncations in the, in the A-band bit of the molecule behave the same. So you can lump them all together, which you can't do with missense alleles. Um, and there are already unpublished data, I think I'm at liberty to say, saying that if you go out into a population, let's say framing them, it isn't framing them, but something like that, and say, OK, I want all my population who have these variants, as 1% of the population, compare them with the rest. Are they quantitatively different? And they are. They have slightly bigger hearts, slightly lower range of rejection fraction, slightly abnormal diastolic function. It's highly likely that that will be one of the factors that determines why some people get away with anthocyclines and others don't, why some people get away with alcohol and others don't. It's not yet been tested. It is very testable. I would be disappointed if it didn't yield part of the answer. Dr. Swin. Uh, Hugh, let me just echo what Lynn said, uh, uh, really informed and, and, and sobering discussion. Th thank you. Um, I want to pick up on your advice about getting closer to the patient, to the phenotype. Mm. Can you give us any insights? You know, phenotyping, you're, you're going to have exquisite imaging in the UK study. But there are neurohormones, there's yeah. renal function, there, there's the inaccessibility of the cardiac tissue itself yeah, that maybe so imaging horrible. won't yeah. tell us. But can you give us some insights that we're, we're starting at ground one, we might be able to do some unique things. How would you suggest we phenotype? Differently. Okay. Or that's, the same. A that's a really big and challenging question. I'm going to have to try and structure my thinking. If I ask, answer you about the rare disease end first and then the common disease end. So the thing that I'm very impressed by in rare disease, so let's say you've got a, a family that unexplained inherited heart muscle disease and you're doing genome sequencing. The thing that has really worked for us and others is not quantitative measures, but qualitative features of the phenotype, particularly extra cardiac features. So this is for people working perhaps in, in, in sick kids, and they, they probably already know that. I'm sure Seema knows this. If you see hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with pre-excitation and with conduction block, it will be a mutation in PRKAG2. We've got a family that we've been studying that has a mixed cardiomyopathy, um, bradycardia, and long QT, we do the genome, we get six or seven variants, we can't work out which. And then Mike Ackerman at the Mayo publishes the exact same variant in a family, the exact same trilogy of symptoms. So I think storing these other things, mental retardation, deafness, skeletal involvement, um, really, really works in the rare disease things. And putting them into the database allows somebody else to go, oh, golly, we saw that gene in that same combination. But the quantitative measures don't tend to work very well in that setting because they're very variable. Within each family, you know, the extent of abnormal ejection fraction is very variable. At the, quant the common complex trait end, um, well, I can only really extrapolate from what I know from coronary disease. What's worked in coronary disease has not been what you would have expected to have worked. So there are circulating biomarkers, circulating proteins, peptides, cytokines that we now see to be predictive, but they weren't on our shortlist. So candidate approaches did not work for us. And I suspect that would be true in heart failure. Now, we might think, oh, it's all about metalloproteinases, or it's all about oxidative stress, or whatever. We're not as good as we think we are. So I would just push you towards hypothesis-free capturing of pretty much anything you can measure, and then doing this big intersection. Because although the complex genetics isn't very good at predicting an aggregate disease like um, heart failure. They're very good at predicting levels of a cytokine or um, levels of some molecule within the tissue. You get lots of power there. And my guess is the things that we will find to be important are not the things we currently know about. If you can do it on tissue, and if you can do it on human heart tissue, as well as on circulating molecules, all power to you and you really want to, and I haven't solved how to do that. I don't work in a transplant center, for example, but, but you know, we, that's a very underexplored space, and I bet there are big wins to, to be had there. It's been fantastic. I think there's one more question, and then we'll break. Thank you. Um, I just wondered how you feel about the ACMG 56 guidelines, Professor Watkins, and how you think the UK are going to implement the secondary findings, mm. um, because that will impact all cardiologists if they start to see 
the 5% of people who actually have variants in cardiac genes who they then have to phenotype and potentially yeah, follow. I'm terrified. Um, <laughs> no, you've, you've, you've put your name on it. You know, so when the statement came out, I thought, well, that's pretty sensible. You know, if you've got a mutation in a long QT gene, you know, you would want to know. If you've got a mutation in a HCM gene, you'd want to know. And it's reasonable to think you might, as a physician, have a responsibility to tell the patient, even if they didn't want it. All of that is true in that small subset of the area where you're really, really sure about your variant. So I think at the moment, if we were testing and a variant came up that was one of these ones, we absolutely know cause of disease and we know has a huge odds ratio, that that is a practical proposition. You might have to deal with that. Though actually I'm not a believer in saying you have to tell the patient against their wishes. I think that's not justifiable. But my concern is exactly yours. That's probably a very small minority of the time. And instead, what we'll find, because people with low prior risk, is rare variants that are private that we've never seen before, that a computer algorithm goes, oh, I bet that causes long QT or cardiomyopathy, that I and maybe you would look at and go, like, there's no evidence. And they are really common. So if I, told, I showed you 500 whole genomes in the Oxford experience, two people there have got truncating alleles in ARVC genes. If they'd come up in my lab, I'd have said diagnostic bona fide mutations. I think they probably are not. I don't believe two out of 500 will have them. So I think we've got a job to do to work out what, how predictive variants are in the normal population that we think we can interpret in the disease population. And until we've done that, because my guess is they're not predictive, I think we need to row back a long way, or our clinical services will be swamped by people who are well, um, who are in the one, two, or three, may, as you say, maybe 5% of the population who've got a variant that could be worrying, and we won't better cope with them, and it will cause more harm than good. I want to thank Professor Watkins for an exceptional keynote session. Thank you.